what I decided to do on, as we leave it is to go through the rest of the lessons that we did not finish last week. I mentioned we didn't cover all I had listed. And I'll say again, though, I've said it several times in the way I'm going over these surveys, if you want to call them that, uh, and looking at the lessons that can be drawn from each book. You can get far more lessons than this from these books, but these are some that really stand out. And uh, what I wanted to do, um, I had made the statement, and um, JD had asked about one of the words I used, and I think we decided that I couldn't remember right at the moment that I'd used the word uh, destroyed, but it wasn't destroyed, it was punishing. Uh, uh, we are to be more interested in salvaging a soul than in punishing a sinner, chapter 8 of John, verses 1 through 11. This, let me just say this further. This gets into motive. Motive. What is the motive of a person? Somebody might think, well, the motive of a Christian, by the very fact that they are a Christian and all that that means, means they desire the salvation of a soul and they have no ill motives or anything like that. But that's just not the case. Um, if you read about Paul thanking uh, God for those who are preaching the gospel, he said there were some who preached the gospel that... Uh, they intended to bring a greater hardship on him, but he was thankful they were preaching the gospel for regardless of their motive, they were still sounding out the saving message. So people can have the wrong motive behind doing the right thing. You see that in um, worshiping God in spirit and in truth. It's not enough for God for you to worship him with the right spirit. You must do it as his truth directs you to do. It's not enough just to go through the motions of what the truth teaches regarding worshiping God and have the wrong spirit. That's we should have plugged in last week when we were talking about the importance of the worship assembly and worshiping God in spirit and in truth and our obligation to, heat, uh, to help create and keep an environment that's conducive to each member who is worshiping in that assembly. So we worship God in spirit and in truth. Can't be one or the other, it's both. It's like he that believeth and is baptized. It's not belief only, it's not baptized only, but it's he that believeth and is baptized. So we want to be sure that we have the right disposition of heart toward the person in sin. This is an example and I'll leave it because I think this is so important, the reason I'm taking it more time with it, even though we covered it last week. Um, we see all that's going on at this present hour in the uh, uh, riots, in the people desiring to kill people because they oppose them. They're just downright criminal. They're savages. Well, uh, we can't, as godly people, have an attitude toward them that causes us to hate them. We must guard our soul and not allow that to happen. Now, I'm not talking about protecting yourself. Uh, I'm also talking about learning where to go not to get into those situations that can make things harder on you. That's called exercising wisdom. Uh, you remember the old show that came out in 69 and it continued to go uh, for a long, long time. Uh, well, just slipped my mind. Uh, country Western show. I mean, not country Western, but country show. Uh, well, I would all know it if I could think of it. Hee-haw. Hee-haw, thank you. Hee-haw. Um, you remember they had the old saying they'd said over and over again, said, oh, so-and-so got his leg broke in two places. And the response would be, well, you ought to stay out of those places. Well, sometimes that's the truth. We get in trouble because we don't know to stay out of things. We have no business being in. Well, we don't want wickedness and evil and all that's going on in the nation cause us to have a wrong attitude toward those folks. But at the same time, it doesn't mean that we want to go uh, uh, 
uh, and um, expose ourselves needlessly to that kind of thing. I remember one time I was riding with the fellows. We came back from a gospel meeting up in the mountains, and uh, we rounded a curve, and it was still daylight, and there was a fellow just laying there on the side of the road. Now, we're up in the Ozarks, and uh, it's twisty, turny, up and down and all around, and uh, he's just laying there. You couldn't tell when we first drove up started slowing down whether it felt dead or whatever. It wasn't moving. He was an old man. He's a relatively young fellow. And, uh, you know, you want to do what's wise. You want to do what's right. You want to be helpful. You want to remember the good Samaritan and who is my neighbor and answer it accordingly. But it doesn't mean that you become reckless. So we didn't get out of the car. We just pulled up beside him and rolled the window down been to call, call out to him. He began to stir, and he was just a drunk that had got out there and passed out inside of the highway. And uh, talked to him enough to get him up and around, but we didn't expose ourselves needlessly to him and what he might do, and the fellow driving the car recognized who he was and talked to him, call him by name. Uh, another time I was driving out of the church building in that same place and uh, came around a curve and here was a man and a woman out in the ditch and another man facing them about 10 feet from them or thereabouts. He had a double bit ax and he was threatening them. And the guy, one of the fellow that he was threatening ran out almost in front of me trying to get me to stop and come help. Well, I wasn't about to get out there with nothing and face a fellow with a double bit axe. And I told him to get out of his way. But I said, there's a sheriff's deputy that lives just up the road. I could see it sitting there. I said, I'll go right up there and tell them. And uh, I had nothing to help matters at all. I couldn't have done any better. Well, he didn't chop anybody up. We got the sheriff's deputy down there and took care of all that. So while we have responsibility to help folks, uh, we have a responsibility also to be careful about ourselves. And uh, when we want to do good to others, even when they do ill to us, and that's primarily from the standpoint of hurting us because, and specifically because we're Christians, we still want to be careful about things. You know, Paul didn't needlessly throw himself to the Jews. He used his Roman citizenship and the privileges it gave him to keep himself out of the Jews' hands. And God in his providence uh, took him to Rome, and we know the story about that. But we must make sure that the disposition of our heart toward the most wicked people is not one of vengeance or hate. And uh, that's something that we must keep in mind as we try to carry the gospel to the lost, because you don't know sometimes what kind of people you're going to come across. And I've come across a few in trying to teach them that um, uh, you had to be careful of. One time in Van Buren, and I, the, the lady was a member of the church, and uh, she's a fine lady. But she was married to somebody that was, he could have made a million dollars in Hollywood as a crook and a, character. He had one eye and it was clouded. He was about six two and he had about always had about a week's worth of beard and he was mean as a snake. Well he didn't like it, me coming over there and studying the Bible. I didn't know this a long time later. He got drunk and I was already gone to church building and he came over there looking for me. And the elders were still there and uh they told me a good while after that of what was going on, but I never had to deal with him. But you don't know what's going to happen when you start mixing up with people. And let me tell you, if we start mixing up with a lot of people nowadays, no matter how kind-hearted we are, no matter how much we want them saved from their sins, if we start teaching them what they need to have talked to them and they'll listen, you don't know what's going to come out of these people. And all you have to do is just listen to them and uh, see how much they're trying to take this nation right now and denying God, denying Christ, upholding abortion. I just listened to a lady a while ago. I can't remember all the things she claimed she was as far as transgender and something about a queen mermaid 
And um, she spoke yesterday at a certain place that's having speakers going on right now. And so you don't know what we're going to run into. All I know is that Christians are redeemed. They've obeyed the gospel. They're to teach the gospel to all they can, and they must have the right disposition of heart while they're particular about what they do. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, buying it back, for the days are evil. Well, that's as up to date as anything published in the news today. That's exactly what the situation is. So we must still live righteous lives. We must still teach the truth. We must look for opportunities to reach the truth or reach people with the truth. And some of them can be very wicked people. I doubt the Philippian jailer was a person that you would really want to cultivate a close friendship with. And yet he was a person never having had the opportunity to know a thing more about the truth of the gospel. When he had that opportunity, he obeyed the gospel. One of the first converts in the city of Philippi. So you don't know, but we don't allow ourselves, we don't permit ourselves to adopt a wrong disposition of heart toward wicked people. And yet we protect ourselves also. It's obvious God feels that way because Romans 13 makes it clear that governments protect good people. And that's an important matter to keep in mind. So I just wanted to elaborate on that a lot more, give emphasis to the uh, important point of having a right attitude toward wicked people, yet not rushing off into something when it's not, ha when it's not a, a must that we do so that gets us into trouble needlessly. We must believe and I hope that, let me say this here, I hope some of you that are speaking on Wednesday night can take some of these things and develop them much further than I have, and they will give you ideas of things you might want to do. You, you might see a lot more in it than I do, but uh, we must remember that we are of Christ, and we must remember that we are his servants, and a servant does what his master tells him. And in 824, chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said to the Jews, except ye believe that I am he, speaking of the Messiah, ye shall die in your sins. Now that makes it plain that we must make the message clear. Uh, we must make it clear that if you do not believe in Jesus Christ, there's no hope for you. That's what the world needs to hear. And uh, you can... If you're a Christian and you're operating as one does under the authority of the New Testament, you have the disposition of heart that Christ had toward reaching those, and you're going to take the same view. Remember the woman at the well, being a Samaritan, said, uh, you Jews say Jerusalem is a place to worship, and we say here. Well, he didn't mince words, and Jesus didn't have the wrong attitude toward her. But he told her as Samaritans, ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Well, I think a number of people say he was awful hard, awful harsh, awful blunt, awful frank, awful candid in his comment to her. Well, you can criticize the Lord if you want to, but I'm not disposed to do so. I am disposed to try to be like he is when I'm trying to reach people with the gospel of Christ because that's the only thing that can save them, and you can't water it down and compromise it, expect to save them. So we must emphasize in this day and age, but always, that there is no go-between as far as man and God's concerned, except the Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. We must preach that in preaching the word or the gospel. Then we must... Uh, Know what he said in chapter 8, verse 47. All this is really tied together, together. Chapter 8, verse 47. He that is of God heareth the words of God. Now, that's interesting. What does that mean? God predestined and foreordained before the world was that you're going to hear the word of God and you're going to obey it no matter whether you want to or not? Well, that's Calvinism. That's not, uh, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about being that he created man, the intellectual, rational creature with a free will to reject the truth or receive the truth. 
And when you take other teachings of the Bible, such as in Luke 8, in the parable of the soils, where the seed is the word of God, verse 11, and the same word sown in the different minds or hearts, and verse 15 said it's in a good and honest heart that the word will find residence and germinate and the person will uh, bring forth fruit. Well, that's what he means. If you're an honest-hearted person, if you're hungry and thirsting after righteousness, then you will understand the truth. You will grasp the truth. Now, it may be that once you've heard it, it may be demanding more of you than you want to, and you may reject it. The Bible's full of people did that. Remember the young ruler? But at the same time, if you are disposed to the truth and you follow the words of God, John 8, 31, 32 makes it clear that the truth will make you free. Well, it doesn't make you free except that you understand it and learn your duty to God, discharge your obligations to God in meeting the conditions or terms of salvation. So that's a point that needs to be gotten over uh, to ourselves first, to the church, and to everybody else. In chapter 9, verse 4, there's a tremendous lesson. Chapter 9, verse 4. We must do the God's work while we have the opportunity. Because there is a time coming when we won't be able to do that work anymore. I was visiting with a fellow the day before yesterday. Not a member of the church, but I have a casual acquaintance with him. And I was talking to him, and he hit an appropriate point. And I said, you think you'll ever grow old? Because he's probably 20 years younger than I am. He doesn't know it, but a 20-year-old already thinks he's old. But I said, do you think you'll ever grow old? He stopped and kind of looked at me and stood there a second and said, well, there's a, there's a expiration date on all of us. <laughs> That's exactly right. We don't know when it's going to expire. Uh, so... We have a limited time to do God's will, and we don't know when the end's coming or how it's coming, whether the Lord comes back first or whether we die. I've preached my heart out over the years to people, gospel meetings, and everywhere I've had the opportunity to beg and plead and teach the truth to get people to see the urgency of obeying the gospel. And still people go right down the road, barely rolling along until they don't. And that's a sad situation. Their time's up. You know, sometimes we preachers will say, or even any speaker, well, I see that my time's up. Well, we're all, every day we live, getting closer to that point. So we must work the works of God while we have time. Now, that's Jesus speaking in John 9, 4. I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man shall work. So there's an end to opportunity. We can't keep saying, well, we'll get it done tomorrow. Because someday we won't be here tomorrow. Then in chapter 10 and verse 10, he talks about giving us an abundant life. When we talk about having anything in abundance, we're talking about having far more than what we need. Christ is able to make our lives when we love the truth, study it, live it, follow it, teach it, to give us what life was meant to be. You know, the Bible talks about, Jesus does in Matthew 5, that the meek shall inherit the earth. Well, meek, what does that mean? It's not weakness. Meek people, when it comes to submission to God's will, how do they inherit the earth? Job's witnesses try to say, see, nobody's going to heaven. If you live like God wants you to, uh, you inherit the earth. That's not what he's saying at all. He's saying when you understand that this world and life in the flesh on this terrestrial ball is designed for you to use to prepare for your long home, which is heaven, then you're going to get the most benefit and happiness out of this life. But you use it for anything else, and you will not have an abundant life. 
and most people don't. So when you recognize, when you face the facts, the reality of what life is about is to get ready for the next life. Really think about it. It's a dressing room. It's a dressing room. You think about how you go through every day, dressing yourself for the day, preparing yourself for the day. Well, you don't intend to stay in the dressing room forever, but you go there long enough to do what's necessary to get ready to face the day. And that's the way life flesh on this earth is, whether you live to be 15 years old or whether you live to be 50 or whether you live to be 80 or whatever, it's a dressing room. And that ties in very well with verse four of chapter nine we just mentioned. The night cometh when no man can work. There's a time coming when there'll be no opportunity to prepare. It will have ended. In chapter 10 and verse 35, we learned that the scripture cannot be broken. I love that passage because it tells me when you understand your Bible, when you know it's God's word, when you know it's given to direct and lead you, when you learn how to study it, when you learn how to authorize it, when you learn how to ascertain that authority, then when you will to submit to God's will and you're, you have the disposition to sacrifice, to be obedient to God if such is necessary, then you're following that which cannot be broken. And you don't see that unless you learn how to write divide the word of truth as you study it, 2 Timothy 2.15. So when people say you can prove anything by the Bible, no, you can't. You can't do that. Or the Bible means this to somebody and the same thing means a different thing to somebody else. Well, it may be because of their own subjective views, but the Bible says the same thing to everybody. They just may not learn it because of all kinds of reasons in their minds that they approach the Bible. We touched on that some in the sermon last Sunday where we pointed out about justification by faith that people approach the book of Romans from the perspective of 2,000 years of error. And especially the last 500 years of justification by faith is the denominational people teach it that salvation is by faith only. Thus, they approach all these scriptures with that already in their mind. Romans 5.1 says that we're justified by faith. Now, in the Baptist mind, what do you think he, he thinks that says when he reads it? Well, he reads it with the idea, you're justified by faith only. But it doesn't say it. But he's been taught it. And he's been taught it so much, and the denomination world believes it, that when he reads a passage like that, he just thinks it goes on about his business. Well, of course, that's not proper Bible study, but you and I can do the same thing. We can read a passage, and we don't test it out for our own personal study to say, no, I've been taught this means this. Does it mean that? And the scriptures, when they're rightly divided, when they're approached as they ought to be with an honest heart, then they're going to say the same thing to everybody. So we have an unchanging word. And I'm glad we do. God didn't say, yesterday, in order to be saved from your sins, you must drink five glasses of water. Now, today, in order to be saved from your sins, you've got to drink a glass of Dr. Pepper. And tomorrow, in order to be saved from your sin, you'll drink anything. And uh, who knows? Now, that sounds silly, but the way people approach the Bible, try to say, well, it doesn't make a difference what you believe, just so you're sincere. Well, if Lee Harvey Oswald was sincere in killing President Kennedy, he is all right, wasn't he? Well, we know better than that. Then in chapter 11, verse 25, the Christ who raised Lazarus from the dead can raise your body from the grave. I don't know that we think enough about the resurrection. But the New Testament has a great deal of emphasis to place on our bodies being resurrected to die no more. I know that when Lazarus, not the Lazarus spoken of in John 11, 
But the beggar Lazarus in Luke 16, I know that when he died, his spirit left his body, and the scripture says the angels carried him into Abraham's bosom, and he was in a place of rest, but he was out of his physical body. Now, when you read 1 Corinthians 15, Paul will talk about the physical body uh, or being out of the physical body as being naked, which means that God intended the human spirit to be housed in a body. Now, I don't understand all that. Don't pretend to. Don't even try to get into it. I just know that for a fact. And thus, in the resurrection, we will receive a body like Christ's glorified body is now. And that's what we should be seeking to attain. Paul declared that that's what he was seeking to attain. And so uh, you get me resurrected eternally with a glorified body like Christ, that ought to make us want to sacrifice anything, be obedient to the will of Christ to obtain that. And then, of course, when I quote so many times in these verses, uh, verses 47 and 48 of John 12, John 12, 47, 48, and the emphasis placed on 48, that the word of Christ will judge us in the last day. Whatever it says now, it will say then. Whatever Christ means by it now, he will mean by it then. And there won't be any dilly-dallying. There won't be any saying, well, now that's, that's my mother there. You can't judge her that way. You think it's going to make any difference? Because he's a righteous judge. He will judge according to what the New Testament teaches. So we need not deceive ourselves thinking that we can get by with sin. Well, we know it's in our lives, but we think, well, look at all these other great things we're doing. It's in harmony with the Lord's will. I don't don't think he'll let all that stop me from going to heaven over this one thing. Well, that's a meritorious acts idea, and that doesn't work. You can't regard sin in your life and expect God to not regard it and expect you to repent of it. It's true of any one of us. Then in chapter 13, 1 through 16, we learn that greatness in the kingdom depends upon our willingness to serve rather than whatever station we might have in life. I won't spend a lot more time on that, but that's probably as big a thing for any of us to learn in the church and the family of God than anything else I can think of. We are saved to serve. Jesus made that clear when he washed the disciples' feet. Be ready to do whatever menial task there is to be done if it furthers the cause of Christ, if it helps your brother. Good Samaritan is, again, a great one to note about that. I don't think we emphasize in that account as much as we ought to that this man had places to go, things to do, schedules to keep, but he set all of that aside to take care of somebody that thought of him less than a dog. And his own people, the Jews' own people, the Levite and the priest wouldn't even stop to help the man. And notice, too, he uh, paid for his medical help and left money at the end to take care of any expenses and said, if that's not enough, I'll take care of it. I'll come back through here, which gives me the idea that he traveled that route often. He had been some sort of businessman. Nevertheless, whatever plans he had, He altered those plans to serve the needs of that Jew who was beaten, was naked, left for dead, robbed. And uh, we ought to be able to do the same thing and be looking forward to doing whatever we can, no matter, as I said, how menial the task, and distasteful the task is, that we might be able to help one another. We have a great challenge before us that's taught in chapter 13, verse 34, chapter 13, 34, and that is to love our fellow Christians as Christ loves us. Let me be so bold and frank as to say, it's not easy to love the brethren sometimes. It's not easy at all. And we're not talking about necessarily an an emotional attachment. We're just simply talking about willing them the best when they don't will you the best. It doesn't mean that you can't state the truth to them. They need to hear when they're in sin, need to straighten out. But they don't, and they may retaliate. But you still love them. If we would just understand the love of God 
for mankind. We would remove the emotional, subjective, sick, syrupy, romanticism love that most people think is what love is. Uh, Paul wrote a marvelous chapter on agape love, 1 Corinthians 13. And yet he withstood Peter to the face because he was be blamed. He had sinned. He had led others away in his sin. And uh, we can do no less to keep the brethren faithful. I wonder how many times if such takes place, and who knows, but if it did, that somebody might come up to somebody else, another brother in Christ, and say, I want to thank you when they're in heaven for sitting me down and talking to me like I needed to be talked to about the sin in my life and how I need to correct it. Because I wouldn't be here now if you hadn't talked to me that way. Many times people will reject it, but the song says it, oh, love that will not let me go. And that's the kind of love that we need to exhibit. That's the kind of love that God extends to the world, or to the world in giving time for people to repent, 2 Peter 3, 9. So we need to love our fellow Christians. We need to want to see them be faithful. We need to want to see them doing all they can do. And uh, when they are all of a sudden out of duty or appear to be, or we may think they are, then we need to do what we can. You know, you don't have to wait for the elders to lead you in being a, a Christian. It doesn't say elders shouldn't, they ought to, it's part of their duty. But it means that whatever there is to be done good, as the Bible defines good in your life day by day, then you don't have to wait somebody come along saying, won't you go out there and do that? You just do it because you're one of the members of the Lord's church. And that involves reaching people, your own brethren. So if you know a brethren who are out of duty or less appear to be, or you don't know what's going on with them, then Take the time. Stop and say, hey, we missed you, whatever. We need to know. And then, of course, we're all familiar with John chapter 14, verse 6, and I mentioned it already tonight, where Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Uh, we can't elaborate. Or we want to elaborate on that much more. It just simply means Christ is the only mediator between God and man. He's the only Savior. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death. Romans 3.23 and 6.23. And if Christ and his gospel can't save a person, that person can't be saved. And we need to understand we have no authority to water down the gospel because the fellow's a pretty good guy in so many other ways, but in some areas he won't quit those sins or take upon himself the things he ought to do. And thus we just kind of want to excuse him and say, well, he'll, he'll be a good guy. No, it doesn't make any difference how many good things a person does as the New Testament defines what is good. If he's an error in one thing, he needs to be corrected. And again, I cite simply Peter. You couldn't get any greater in service to God than what Peter the apostle was, but he sinned, and Paul loved him enough to confront him for his sins. And it's obvious by implication that Peter must have acknowledged his sin and repented. Of course, he, he was used to the master rebuking him, so what was it for Paul to rebuke him for a sin that he knew he had done? It also says that when we are rebuked, we ought to be honest enough with God and ourselves to admit we deserved it if we did and do something about it. Chapter 15, verse 5, apart from Christ, we can do nothing. That's the importance of being in Christ and being faithful to the Lord, be you steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as your labor is not in vain in the Lord. First Corinthians 15, 58. All spiritual blessings and heavenly places are in Christ. Ephesians 1, 3. So to remain acceptable to Christ as a member of his blood bought church, we must abide in his will. Now, when we cease to abide in his will, then we're apart from him. We need to repent, confess those sins, turning from them, and come to him again to be faithful. Chapter 15, verse 20, 
And these are all said originally to the apostles of Christ. This is a private, intimate, personal discussion uh, um, Jesus had with his apostles regarding the fact that it's not very far in the future he was going to leave this world. So he's talking to them, but many great lessons come out of these things that help us in the church today. Uh, we as servants are no greater than our Lord. So if they persecuted Jesus, then that's what they're going to do to us as we're faithful. Chapter 15, verse 20. Chapter 15, 20. So we need to know what Paul said to Timothy. All who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Now, I don't know that we're all going to be fed to lions tomorrow. But I don't know what tomorrow brings. I know if I live righteous today, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Whatever the morrow has to offer, if I'm alive tomorrow, I'll be able to face it with the truth of God. We need to remember the unity that comes only by people willing to submit to the authorized will of heaven as set out in the New Testament, John 17, 20. We are expected to be one, even as God and, uh, or the Father and the Son are one. And I do not understand all that's involved in that, but I know where it begins and ends with us on this earth. And that is, it begins and ends with our honest and good heart that hungers and thirsts after righteousness to do the will of God when we learn it and that we live our whole lives that way. God will make up the difference in his grace when the end comes. You know, I don't know what that thorn in the flesh was that Paul had, but it really bothered him prayed three times to be removed. And finally, Christ told him that his grace was sufficient for him. There is a great lesson we all need to learn about that. God's favor is extended to those who are faithful members of the church. The gospel system itself is God's grace. Man sinned. He was lost. There's no hope for him. If God dealt with him justly, then, and that's all by law system, there's no hope for man. But God intervened through Christ. And thus, the grace of God that brings salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world. Notice the grace, the favor of God that no man deserves nor can merit. The grace of God came teaching, Paul said to Titus. The grace of God came teaching. So when men are saved by grace, they must receive that teaching and notice that it teaches us we must live a certain way. So it does do any good to say, well, it's all on God's side. God's grace saves us. Nothing I can do in order to be saved. When that passage itself said to a preacher of the gospel, that we are to deny in godliness, worldly lust, live righteously and soberly and godly in this present world, which also teaches there's no second chances. It's in this present age that we're to live righteous. In uh, chapter 19, verse 17, and we also covered this in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, John 19, 17, um, Jesus bore his cross. And I've already touched on that tonight. What does that mean? So must we. There are sacrifices to be made. There's no sense saying that, well, I can be faithful to God and go to heaven and never have to make a sacrifice. That's just not true. It's a big lie. So we need to understand whatever the cross I must bear is, then I will gladly bear it and be faithful to Christ. Let me drop back to chapter 18, verse 36. Christ's kingdom is not like the kingdoms of this world. Since the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom and the kingdom is the church, is the body of Christ, is the temple of the Lord, then we need to understand those terms describe different aspects of the realm of the saint. And we need to recognize that the kingdom of Christ has his king sitting at the right hand of God and that he reigns on earth through his last will and testament, his word, seed of the kingdom, word of the gospel, and uh, we live by it. And thus we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven because we were baptized into Christ, born of water and the spirit, made citizens of the kingdom of heaven, John 3, 3 and 5. And thus we are faithful in that kingdom 
serving King Jesus as we're obedient to his will. Then two in chapter 20 and verse 28, chapter 20 and verse 28, we need to follow the example of Thomas. When we see the adequate evidence concerning no matter what the topic is, then we ought to reason honestly from that evidence. And when it comes to Christ, we should conclude as he did, my Lord and my God. But when it comes to proper worship, the organization of the church, the work of the church, elders, deacons, preachers, and so on, then the evidence for those things is found also in the New Testament of Christ. And we abide by the authority of it, Colossians 3, 17, and so doing, we know we're right. You know, sometimes I think we've been led to believe that we ought to be ashamed of ourselves because we can know we are right. Now think about that for a minute. Think about what's happened to us that somebody says, well, you're just a, a brash character sitting there saying, you know, you're right. Well, Jesus said, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Well, can you know the truth and know that you know it? Well, you better. So when people try to tell me denominationalism is perfectly acceptable to Christ, and I just simply believe that Christ is the Son of God and ask him to come into my heart, then I pick a church that suits me because I'm sincere and all of that, then it's all all right. Beg your pardon. The New Testament of Jesus Christ does not teach it. And I know that's wrong. If you know you're right, you know what's wrong. Is baptism a burial in water? Yes. Is baptism sprinkling water on somebody? No. On the matter of it being a burial, the mode of baptism, do you know you're right? Romans 6, 3 and 4, Colossians 2, 12, yes. Well, then on everything else pertaining to forgiveness of sins and righteous living, you can know when you're wrong and you can know you need to change and you can know you're right. I'm grateful we have the ability from our God to be able to ascertain the truth, honestly evaluate our own lives, and turn from what we have learned to be error to embrace what we know to be right. And that when we go to bed at night and settle our minds to sleep, we can go to bed knowing we're right. That doesn't mean you don't need to grow into greater knowledge of the truth, but you know the truth. And you know that you know it. And you don't need to be ashamed of it. We need to, as we come down to a close in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, chapter 20, 30, 31, we need to know that the gospel records are given that we might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, we've said that over and over again, but it can't be emphasized enough. And if you're dealing with friends and family outside of Christ who are lost in their sins, that needs to be impressed upon them. Whatever view you have of Jesus Christ, if it's not according to the scriptures and it runs counter to what the scriptures teach, that's wrong. You need to change to embrace what the scriptures actually teach. And if you're not studying your Bible, you know you're not studying it. And that's wrong. And if you're going to know the mind of Christ, then you have to study it, learn how to study it, have the right attitude do it and embrace the truth, making whatever sacrifices one needs to make to be obedient to the truth. So in the Gospel of John, we'll sum it up this way. In the Gospel of John, Jesus is presented as the one in whom we must believe because that's getting to first base. It doesn't mean you've gotten home, but unless you believe he's the Son of God, you can't do anything else. In the epistle, John, Jesus is the one that we must love with our whole being and all that we have. When you come down to the apostle John in Revelation, then you see that we're to do what we're doing now. He is the one for whom we wait until at the proper time, he decides to bring everything back to the judgment or into judgment. Well, as I said, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, these points I've made, you could add to them. 
you could find more in here than not. But do you see how that you've got enough material just in what we've studied, what I've listed as study points, that preach sermons from now to however far in the future you want to go? And we haven't even got into Acts on for the rest of the New Testament. But you won't get those points unless you sit down and study. That is, study the Bible. Have a pen and paper, write down those points. Say this, I'm going to develop a lesson around this. Or I'm going to pursue this further in my own personal Bible study. Well, we'll call it quits on John and having studied then the biographical section of the New Testament, the three synoptic uh, accounts of Christ's life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and the one more philosophical account of it, book of John. We'll just continue on, Lord willing, and go into the book of Acts, which is a continuation of the Gospel of Luke. Keep that in mind. So next week, Lord willing, we'll continue our study in the same approach by studying some of the Acts of some of the apostles in Luke's book, the book of Acts. Any questions, any comments?